Welcome to Impact Discipleship 2021. Hey, there you go. Excellent job. Hold on to that. Yes, welcome everybody. Here we are again. I'm going to talk very fast today so we can hit our time. Probably won't happen. Um, so listen, today we are entering the third chapter of 1 Peter, and uh, as promised, but we will only be covering the first seven verses today. We left off in chapter 2 with teachings about submission, if you guys remember, related to governing authorities and a uh, call to submission for servants. So when the chapter that we're studying today begins and we see the phrase, wives likewise, it's the call to submission that we're talking about. Uh, you have to remember that the original writings had no chapters and verses, so it's hard for us to you know, go to a chapter and when you hear the words however or therefore or likewise, you have to go back and look. I would like to remind you all that any time we're talking about wives and husbands and marriage, I would love to refer you to a teaching on the KM website under the Impact Discipleship tab that's right on the homepage, you could find a teaching called Quintessential Marriage, one that we did on Ephesians chapter 5 back long ago. Uh, I have heard by, by adults that that's one of the most powerful marriage teachings they've ever heard. So as we launch in, we're going to go ahead and we're going to read the, the all seven verses of 1 Peter chapter 3, the first seven verses, and then we're going to break them down. I'll warn you in advance uh, that probably 80% of the entire teaching we're going to do today is going to focus on just that seventh verse. I've discovered in my studies of preparing this that that seventh verse is so ripe and filled with information. It might be one of the most important verses in the entire Bible. That's a pretty powerful thing to say, I think, or a pretty bold thing to say. So go ahead, Katie. Launch us away. Take that mic right there. First seven verses, First Peter chapter 3. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. When they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair wearing gold or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. Husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being hers together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. There you go. Thank you so much. Father, we come before you. We thank you so much for today. As we enter this uh, third chapter of First Peter, that you be with us and illuminate minds and hearts in our teaching called His Eyes Are on the Righteous. And we'll call this part one. Chapter three may be a part two and a part three. I'm not really sure how long it's going to take us to get through this chapter, but we'll at least call this part one. And as we launch into the, uh, the first two verses, wives, remember, Likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. This is not the only place in the scriptures we, we see the teaching about wives being submissive to their husband. There's a lot of misunderstanding about what that means. Again, I'll refer you to quintessential ma marriage. It uh, gives a good teaching on that. Um, but this is the one place where we see the potential fruit of the conduct of a wife. Here you'll notice the wife uh, can win over a husband. So what do you think that's talking about? It's not talking about you know, the finding favor and just having a good marriage. It's talking about a, a potential husband who's not in the faith, who's, who hasn't come to the knowledge of the Lord, the very conduct of the believing wife could win over the husband. Um, and when, when they say what that, when, when the author says what that conduct looks like, 
he uses the phrase chaste conduct accompanied by fear. So let's, let's talk through what some of these things mean. If you uh, turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 12 and through 16, Jenna, why don't we go ahead and read that? 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 12 to 16. We see a little bit of detail written by the Apostle Paul about a, a wife's submission and how that might be, or a wife's conduct, how that might affect an unbelieving husband. Go ahead. To the rest I say this, I, not the Lord, if any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, he must not divorce him. She must not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. But as it is, they are holy. But if the unbeliever leaves, so it be so. The, let it be so. The, the brothers or the sister is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. How do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? So you see, of course, here it goes both ways, right? A, a husband and wife. Um, living with an unbelieving spouse can, by their conduct, actually bring the other to the faith. And so uh, it's important. It doesn't say, you know, there is, a, there is an accommodation here where Paul says, if the unbelieving spouse wants to leave and there's nothing you can do about it, uh, I'm not going to bind you up with the requirement to stay with a spouse who's not a believer who wants to bolt. You know, you're not going to be bound up to that. So if you want to let them go, you can let them go. Better choice, let your conduct and your life be such a witness to them that it transforms them. Um, of course, like mentioned earlier, submission is a main, a main area of Ephesians chapter 5, this area of scripture often used about instructions to married couples. In that area, in, in uh, verses 21 to 24, it says submitting one, first it says this, very important, submitting one to another in the fear of God. So you don't go off on a deep end when you get to the next section where it says, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Uh, Realize the verse that came before says, submit one to another. It's talking about mutual submission of believers inside the faith, including inside of marriage. It's not just wives submit to your husbands, but it's the submission, nature of submission inside of marriage that will allow a wife to submit to her husband, meaning the husband is already submitted both to his wife and to the Lord. And then it says, for the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, let so wives be to their own husbands in everything. Uh, that's not a bad thing, right? That's a good thing. You know, we've covered this in the past, where we see the importance, if um, we look back at a, what we covered in this letter already, back in chapter two, verse 12, it says, having your conduct honorable, this is what kind of like, what does your witness look like to others? Your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good work, or in this case, we're talking about in First Peter, by your chaste conduct about the wife, which they observe, they will glorify God in the day of visitation. So we already saw that in this, in this letter, that he's saying, you know, we have that, ability to affect others just by our conduct, just by the way we act. Uh, of course, in Colossians, um, Nicolette, turn to James 1.22, and I'm going to read one more section in Colossians. Look what it, Colossians 4, 5, and 6, it says, walk in wisdom towards those on the outside. What does that mean? To those not in the faith redeeming the time, let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to an answer each one. When you come into conflict, when you come into contact with a non-believer, a non even someone 
who might be aggressive against you, God says, let your speech be with grace. Grace means supernatural empowerment. Let, let your words carry the grace of God. And then it says seasoned with salt. Of course, you know, in the first century, um, salt was for everything, right? Uh, flavor, preservation of food. They didn't have ice, ice uh, machines and refrigerators and freezers to preserve food. The, the food was, the food was um, preserved with salt. That's why it says in the, go, in, in the Gospels, uh, it says, if your salt becomes unsalty, it's good for nothing. Yeah, because salt that doesn't have the characteristics of salt can't be used as salt. A believer without the characteristics of a believer is not useful as a believer. So it says, let, let your words be with grace seasoned with salt. Right. And what does it say about conduct versus just lip service in James? Go ahead, read James 1, what? 22 to 25. Okay. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself, yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his nature his natural face in the mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. You said 25 too? 25. Okay. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and preserves being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. You see the difference here? Don't just talk about being a believer. Act like a believer. And in your acting, you will be blessed in doing. This is the same thing, same theme. You know, just what Peter is saying in, in uh, the third chapter here is that Specifically, when it comes to wives, their conduct as believers will have great power and effect over their husbands. That's, that's what he's saying. Then he goes on in the next two verses, 1 Peter 3, 3 and 4, and he says, now he's addressing the woman again. Boy, does this have relevance for us today more than ever. Think about these words now. Think about what you face in this generation the assault of physical, physicality in this generation. The assault, the assault of uh, immodesty in this generation. Listen to these words. Do not let your adornment be merely outward. And then he, he talks about things today which we would think is very classy or even no big deal. right? He says arranging the hair, wearing gold, putting on fine apparel. You know, today he would say, you know, posting, uh, immoral, um, ex exposing pictures of yourself in positions and moves and dances and, and outfits that make you look like something I won't say here. Don't, don't let that be what people see in you. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty. Why does he say that? Because that outward stuff, that sexiness or that bare chest of a man and his muscles, that stuff is corruptible. It's all going away. It's all just here today and gone tomorrow. No, let the real beauty be incorruptible beauty. And then he says to the woman, you know what that looks like in a woman? A gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. So let's talk about outward versus inward. Um, Elijah, uh, Matthew's Gospel, the 23rd chapter. Matthew's Gospel, the 23rd chapter. That's you know, and uh, starting uh, just two verses, 27 and 28. You know, Yeshua, when he was um, confronted by the Pharisees, the holy men, they looked a certain way outside, didn't they? They had the holy robes, they had the long tassels, they had the head coverings. Man, did they look holy. Marching around in the streets, commanding all sorts of like respect. But what, what does he say to these, these leaders? Read 23, 27 to 28. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and 
all unclean uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocr hypocrisy and lawlessness. Do you see that? You look a certain way on the outside, but on the inside you're ugly. You're dirty. Outside you look white, like a whitewashed tomb. That's like saying, oh, you can make a grave look so beautiful on the outside, but all I'm telling you is that what's on the inside is a dead person. That's what hypocrisy looks like. So, you know, what Peter says to the woman, don't let that be who you are. Don't let your entire nature be, be um, defined by your outward appearance or your outward beauty. That's corruptible. That's fading away. That means, that means nothing, right? But rather, let it be about your heart. Uh, who's up next to read? Isaiah. Why don't you turn to Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23. And I'll read you the short verse from 1 Samuel 16, 7. Talking about David, King David, right? Um, you know that God was seeking out a king uh, and David's dad had a lot of uh, sons. David was the young one, the one out in the field. And uh, he marched all the sons in front of Samuel and said, is this the one that God's going to anoint as the king? Look at him. He's strappy. He's big. He's good looking. And this is what the Lord said to Samuel. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or his physical stature because I refused him. I refuse that. That's not what I'm judging. For the Lord does not see as a man sees. A man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord is looking at the heart, the hidden person of the heart. Right? What does the heart tell us about people? Isaiah, Proverbs 4.23, 4, can you read that? I have you in the wrong place? I think it's in Proverbs 23. 423. Huh? 423. 423. This is what God is, is uh, seeing. All right. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issue of life. Th that's... Oh, sorry. I... <laughs> yeah, I meant to... T okay, yes. 423 is what I was referencing when... I'll read it from Luke. Yeshua said this in Luke's gospel. He said, a good man... So you are in the right place. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good. An evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, brings forth evil. It's not what he looks like on the outside. It's what's inside his heart that's... That's what's really inside of him. And then it says, quoting this Proverbs 4.23, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What is God, what, in, what is incorruptible beauty? According to, according to God, a gentle and quiet spirit. Proverbs 15.1 says, a soft answer turns away wrath, but the harsh word stirs up anger. Philippians 4.5 says, let your gentleness be known to all men. For the Lord is at hand. And Proverbs 17, 27, and 28 says, He who has the knowledge spares the words, and a man of understanding has a calm spirit. Even a fool is counted wise when he holds his peace. When he shuts his lips, he is considered perceptive. Yeah, don't just jump and speak. Have a quiet and gentle spirit. That was what Paul is saying uh, Peter is saying in, in, his, in his verse that what God is looking at for a wife is a calm and gentle spirit. Someone that's going to hold her peace, not, not be quick to speak. You're going to see, you might say, well, don't, don't you have a right to speak? Wait till you see the power. What I think is one of the, the greatest traits of a woman, the greatest traits of a wife, even possible, is coming in these verses. For you young men that are listening, you're going to realize there is no greater asset in a wife than what's, come, what's going to be taught to you shortly. And why he's saying this calm spirit is so necessary in a woman, right? As we go on to verses 5 and 6, 
he gives us a comparison. He says, by the way, this is not an unusual request in the New Testament. It says, for, for in this manner, in former times, holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves. You just said, don't adorn yourself on the outside. Adorn yourself on the inside. That inside is about your heart. It's about what you look like on the inside. He says, this is not a new request because holy women in the past adorned themselves, listen, listen to what he phrased, being submissive to their own husbands. And then he gives us an example. As Sarah, who obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And then he brings it back to the New Testament and he says, whose daughters you are if you do not if you do good and not afraid of terror. So where did Sarah call Abraham Lord? You can write this down. Genesis 18, verses 9 to 12. This is when uh, Abraham is being questioned about his wife. Where is, where is Sarah, your wife? She's here in the tent. They have this conversation. Um... And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Sarah was listening in the tent behind him. And when Sarah and Abraham were old, well advanced in years, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing, therefore Sarah laughed. This is when Sarah is being promised a son. She laughs. After I have grown old, and then she says this. She's speaking to her husband. You're telling me God promised you. She overhears God promising Abraham, your wife's going to have a son. She's laughing. Are you kidding me? I'm going to have a son? I'm old. I'm past childbearing years. She says, she says, after I've grown old, shall I pleasure my Lord, talking to her husband, after I'm old? So he, the right Peter is saying, wow, she, she calls her. And of course, in this spelling is just means master, right? Lord. Can you imagine a woman saying that? Again, don't get the wrong intention of what that means because you'll see that inside of marriage, God gives the woman preeminence. He doesn't mean submission lower. He means preeminence. And, and you're going to see what I, what I mean by that. He also has this phrase in, the, um, in this fifth verse that says, um, or the sixth verse, 1 Peter 3, 6, uh, calling you all daughters. Daughters of who? Daughters of Sarah and Abraham. You today sitting at this table, why are you a daughter of Sarah or Abraham? and Abraham? Well, because Abraham, through Sarah, had Isaac, and Isaac is the seed of promise through whom all believers are named. By the way, it doesn't mean your birth line has to come from there. As soon as you become a believer in Christ, you are grafted into the seed of Abraham. It says in Galatians 3.29, if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. It doesn't matter what your bloodline says. As soon as you confess Christ, your lineage in the faith comes through Abraham through Sarah. Therefore, you women sitting at the table and everybody listening, you are daughters of Sarah. That's why Peter says that. Of course, we're going to finish one other little section before we get to the, the length of what we're going to spend our time today. And uh, he finishes this uh, sixth verse saying, do the right thing. You have nothing to fear if you're doing the right thing. Many of you might look on the world today and say, what's going to happen to us um, is evil rising in the world. And God says, don't worry about it. Your job is one thing. Do the right thing. You have no fear to live under if you're doing the right thing. It says this also in Romans 13, 3. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. The rulers are really, godly rulers are just there to bring terror on those doing evil. Do what's good, and you'll have praise from those same authorities. And of course, we're going to see in this very same chapter, very likely next week in verse 12, part two of this teaching, it literally says this, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. The 
face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off a remembrance from them in the earth. So, the admonition, you just do the right thing. Get your eyes off of anything else. And finally, I say finally, even though we have a ways to go in the teaching, I want to tell you, here's the verse. Mark this down. I've always thought this to be a very powerful verse, and I've had certain teachings on it over the years, but never have I kind of explored the depth of it like I did this past week. Listen to what it says. Now it turns and it addresses the husband. And you're going to see what the husband is called to do and be according to his own wife. Husbands likewise. Remember, he just said, wives submit to your husband. We just saw what that means. Then he says, husbands likewise dwell, live with, abide with them with understanding. Here's where the preeminence comes. Giving honor to the wife, and this is where it's going to seem like it doesn't make sense, as to the weaker vessel. This verse has stirred up so much feminism in the world. The weaker vessel. How dare you? And then it says this. And as being heirs together, this is all one verse, of the grace of life. Why do you need to live this way, men? So your prayers may not be hindered. Can you imagine? The prayers of a man are at the mercy of the treatment of his wife, of how he treats his wife. God hearing a man's prayers are being judged, at least in one parameter, on how he dwells with his wife with understanding, give honors, gives honor to his wife, treats her as the weaker vessel. I have five pages of notes on that phrase coming up. And realizes that you're joint heirs together. Let's, let's start with understanding. Um, uh, Javin, turn your Bible, I, we skipped Javin. Javin, turn your Bible to Song of, so- Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon. I want you to understand what it means to dwell with your wife. Song of Solomon, chapter 4. It might be called Song of Songs or just songs in your Bible. Here's the two sides of the coin. For men, what we understand with this scripture about understanding and dwelling with your wife, understanding, it's about your mindset about your wife. Men, it's about your mindset. Women, it's about your expectation of how you should be treated. I would recommend highly anybody interested in marriage to read all of Song of Solomon. It's just eight chapters. It's Solomon's understanding of love and marriage. For men, this is about your mindset. For women, this is about your expectations. I I picked this, these two verses out of Song of Solomon, just two, characteristic of the entire eight chapters. Uh, you You might want to start a letter. Dear wife, dear wife, this is what you do to me. This is what I think of you. Go ahead, Javin, read Song of of Solomon 4, 9 and 10. You have ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. You have ravished my heart with one look of your eyes, with one link of your necklace. How fair is your love? My sister, my spouse, how much better than wine is your love? And the scent of your perfumes than all spices. Dear wife, you have ravished my heart. The entire Song of Solomon is that is that concept. Husbands, dwell with a wife with this in mind. Wife, you have ravished my heart. And and he calls her a sister because aren't because that's what you are. Like when you're when you're in the faith, you get married to your spouse, she's also your sister. Your sister in the faith, right? Okay, how do, you, how, do you, how do you do this? Husbands, love your wives and don't be bitter towards them. Colossians 3.19. For all of us, let no corrupt words proceed out of your mouth, but only what is good and necessary, necessary to impart grace. 
Ephesians 4, 29. Intimacy. Now concerning these things which you wrote to me, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of sexual morality, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. Let each husband render to his wife affection do her. Husband, you owe your wife affection, and likewise also wives to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, a husband does not have authority over his own body, but a wife does. Do not deprive one another except for a consent of time that you may give yourself to fasting and prayer and come together again so Satan does not tempt you for lack of self-control. 1 Corinthians 7, 1 to 5. This is how you dwell with each other, especially a husband to a wife with understanding. And if we go back to Ephesians chapter 5, we won't read the whole thing again. Again, I'll refer to the teaching, quintessential marriage. Uh, Ephesians 5, 25 to 32 says it. Husbands, love your wives. Husbands ought to love their wife like Christ loved the church. That means you die for her. So when we, when we see this little phrase in, 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 um, in the scripture, wives submit to your husbands, realize under what context that's happening. Husbands, die for your wives. That's the entire context. Of course, in, in uh, Ephesians 5, Paul gives an explanation point. He says, by the way, that's the exact concept of Christ and the church. That's why God gave us marriage. And that's why there's a death in marriage of a husband dying for his wife. Because that's exactly what Christ did for the church. The proverb again says about a wife. Listen, listen to a hus- what a husband has to think. An excellent wife is a crown on her husband's head. But she who causes him shame is like rottenness to his bones. How important is an excellent excellent wife. Of course, if you read the most famous proverb, which one is this about wives? Proverbs 31, the 10th and 12th, 12th, 12th verse, 10 to 12th verse. Who can find a virtuous wife? For her worth is far more than rubies. The heart of a husband safely trusts her, so he will have no lack of gain. She does good and not evil all the days of her life. What a value it is to have a good wife and what a value it is for that wife to operate inside that marriage in in her perfection and only the husband can create that environment for to do that. And now this phrase. If you if you are not apt to take notes, you should take notes now. This would be it. I I even highlighted this. and These notes will go up online later today. This phrase, the weaker vessel. What a horrible choice of words those might be if you don't understand what they mean uh, in the modern day. How much controversy have these words caused for a woman rising up? How dare you? We can do anything a man can do. Well, I'll say you can do anything a man can do and more. And more. So much so that as I explore this, these ideas, that I have five pages of scriptures and notes pertaining to the weaker vessel. Weaker. I start off weaker, question mark. Weaker? The female or the woman has a more sensitive spirit, what the Bible calls the helper spirit. Because, listen to this, you may, you may have heard this from me, you may have not, you may have never heard this before. Because the Holy Spirit is female. It's the female portion of the Trinity, the divine family. The Holy Spirit is the feminine or female portion of the Trinity. The word in Greek used in Peter's letter is the word asthenes. Listen to this. Yes, for weaker. The word weaker. It means, it sounds terrible when you read the definition. It means lack of necessary resources or insufficient, literally, without adequate strength. It sounds terrible. But what it really is saying is, hence, a woman is totally dependent. Now, 
before that makes you go, what? Step back and see this with spiritual eyes. She has been fashioned from the beginning with a need to depend on God alone always. And that means she is naturally much more sensitive to the Holy Spirit as a necessity. She's been created to be dependent on God. When we bring this into the natural and we insert the husband, of course, and the child, when we talk about the family, the human family is a reflection of the divine family, we can easily recognize that the wife's role in marriage is as the Holy Spirit arm of the family. That's why she's the weaker vessel. She's wholly dependent on hearing from God. What a great asset that is to a man. As such, husbands must appreciate this as a unique and honored function of a wife or really any woman. As opposed to how, now, now watch this, as opposed to how all New Testament English translations refer to the spirit, and we're going to see this, we're going to go through some verses in a moment, as masculine. All your New Testament versions refer to the Holy Spirit as masculine. He, 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 he. You should now remove the he from your Bibles and replace the he when referring to the New Testament with the she. Always. This would be consistent with the Old Testament reference to the Holy Spirit. The first place we see the reference, what book do you think the first place we see the reference to the Holy Spirit is in the Bible? What book in the Bible do you think that might be? Genesis, the youngest person at the table. Genesis, the second verse in the Bible. I'll read it to you. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the earth. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. When you look up that word in Hebrew, ruach, it says feminine noun. It's a feminine noun. That's not an accident. So when Adam was in need of a companion, God had to extract... By the way, did God create a female or did he extract the female out of Adam? He extracted the female out of... Why? Because God created Adam with both male and female DNA. Do you know that? That a man has male and female DNA, XY chromosomes, and a woman only has female DNA. She doesn't have any male DNA. A man has both male and female, but in order to accentuate the feminine DNA, he extracted the woman out of the man. So turn your Bibles to, who's up next? Daniel, Genesis chapter 2. I want you to read 18 to 22. You got it? To what? 18. Genesis 2, 18 to 22. I want you to hear this language because it's important when we, when we, when we go to the New Testament and we see scriptures about the Holy Spirit and you become more comfortable from now on forward inserting she instead of he every time you see new te- see the spirit go ahead daniel i'm ready go ahead and the lord god said it is not good that man should be alone i will make him a helper comparable to him out of the ground the lord god formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to adam to see what he would call them and whatever adam called each living creature that was its name so Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. There wasn't a helper comparable to him. Go ahead. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib, which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. Wow. He wasn't complete unless you could extract the woman out and present the woman as a helper comparable to him. So he made a woman and brought him to the man. Right? Now let's see this will make perfect sense in the New Testament. So 
Keep in mind, the weaker vessel, the spirit, the helper, is not on her own and does not speak for herself and will not speak on her own authority. So in the New Testament, when we refer to the Holy Spirit, the introduction of the Holy Spirit, listen to the words of Christ when he introduces the Holy Spirit on how it's exactly the picture that you see in, in Genesis and further in the letters of Paul and other, other places in the New Testament. Listen, listen to what Christ said. Why don't we do this? Um, Sage, turn your Bible to John's Gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Chapter 16. We're going to be in John. Everybody turn to John's Gospel. We're going to be in there for a little while. Well, we're going to go back and forth into John's Gospel. So you're going to read verses 13 to 15. John's Gospel. No, I know. No, it's in the back of the Bible. You're in the front. New Testament. This is why we have paper Bibles. What chapter? Chapter 16, verses 13 to 15. I think you've said that every week. I know. We have paper Bibles. Look. Go ahead. Matthew, chapter 16. You need to have the, the mic that's there. Yeah, that's why I gave it to you. You have to hold it in your hand. No, John's Gospel. Yes, John's Gospel is the fourth Gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. It's after Luke. This is why. Okay. 16, 13 to 15. Listen to the language of the role of the Holy Spirit. Pick up the mic, please. <coughs> However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that, all things that the Father has are mine, therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. A little... You said until 16. Yeah, that's it. 15. So you see this, this, Yeshua is talking about the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the truth, and you see how it's always he, 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 right? It really should be she, because the Spirit is the feminine part of of the Trinity. We'll talk about that in discussion. But, But I want you to see the nature the Holy Spirit does not speak on her own authority. Right? Now, you might say, oh, that's terrible. Weaker vessel, right? No, don't see it that way. See it as an equal arm of the Trinity fulfilling the exact role that the Holy Spirit is supposed to fill. It's not a negative thing. When you stay in your zone of what you're created for, the more powerful you are, right? Now, don't these following scriptures make more sense in the New Testament when you see this perspective and think of a woman as a Holy Spirit? They should now seem powerful, not offensive to women. When you think that the Holy Spirit doesn't speak on her own authority. Okay? Look, I'll read it to you. These scriptures I'm going to read to you, this scripture specifically in 1 Timothy 2, is taken so offensively by women in the modern day, but if you insert Holy Spirit for woman here, you would not think that anymore. I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man, it says. I desire, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold pearls or costly clothing, which is proper for a woman professing godliness with good works. Let a woman learn in silence, which is submission, and do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over man, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first and then Eve. Now, why would Paul, writing to Timothy, talk about this woman's silence and submission and then talk about Adam and Eve? 
because he was referencing the feminine being drawn out of the man, the spirit being drawn out, just like Christ said in, in John 16, the spirit never speaks on her own, but waits to be told what to say by the Father. That would never, you would never think that's offensive in the, in the Trinity, but somehow we can track it down into the earth and women get offended. It's not an offense. It's a mandate. It's powerful, right? And so now you can see the physical manifestation in John 16, that she doesn't speak on her own authority. She waits to hear. And then you continue in 1 Corinthians 14. Who's up next? Grace, can you turn to 1 Corinthians 14? Listen to this now, right? So when you, when you get the idea, she will not speak on her own, going back to John's gospel, if I insert the, she, the she instead of he for Holy Spirit, she will not speak on her own, but whatever she hears, she will speak, and she will tell you the things to come. She will take of what is mine and declare it to you. Can you imagine in marriage if the relationship between a husband and a wife was that? Hey, she's going to tell you what's going to happen. You should listen. Right? My wife and I have this conversation all the time. She goes, you know, you know, you should listen. It's very rare that she's incorrect. Right? Very rare when she's in the spirit that she's incorrect. Right? Go ahead. 1 Corinthians 14, 34 to 37. Let your woman keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for women to speak in church. Or did the word of God come originally from you, or was it you only that it reached? If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. Do you see how bad that sounds? It sounds horrible. It sounds horrible. But but if I but if I insert if I insert it's horrible. That is not correct. If I insert what you're learning now about the Holy Spirit, and he says, as the law also says, what law? There's a divine family. The Holy Spirit is part of that family, doesn't speak on her own, right? Let him acknowledge that the things I write are actually the commandments of God. Does that mean a woman doesn't speak? No, she hears from God and speaks to her husband. That's what it's saying. It's not an offense. It's, if, and, and I know many of you here, like I could see the, the young, especially down at the table with the commentary, you read those verses and you immediately take offense to them like somehow it's putting a woman in a lesser position. It is not a lesser position. It's a specific position. And when you're thinking about, uh, you know, a woman is not created to be a father, she's created to be a mother. A woman is not created to be the father authority, authority she's created to be the spirit authority. That's what it's saying. And if a woman will take what is Yahweh's and declare it, what a help that would be to her husband. The spirit is the helper. Like it says in Genesis 2.18, when God extracted a woman out of a man, he said, I will make him a helper comparable to him. So let's turn our Bibles back to John's Gospel. Shiloh? John's Gospel. You should be there already. I am in John's Gospel. Okay, let's go to John 14, already there. 15 to 17. If you love me, keep my commandments. And, if, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. You see, talking about the Holy Spirit, again, you see all the masculine language. It should really she. be she. The helper is Eve. The helper is Eve. But here it's called the Spirit of Truth, and the reason why the world can't handle it is because you can't see this Spirit. 
It's something that's dwelling inside of you. Okay? Um, Keep reading. Yeah, why don't you skip ahead to uh, chapter 15, verses 26 and 27. Um, same, same John's Gospel, 15. Yeah. But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who process, proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. And you, and you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. So the Spirit of witness, the, Spirit, the Holy Spirit bears witness. The Holy Spirit testifies. The Holy Spirit testifies. Shiloh, stay there. Go, go to chapter 16. What part? Uh, 7 to 11. 7 11? <laughs> Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is your advantage that I go away. For it, for if I do not go away. The Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send her. There you go. Excellent. To you. That's it? No, keep going. To 11. And, and when he has come. She has come, right? Yeah. <laughs> he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and you see me no more. Of judgment, because of the ruler of this world is judged. It's a spirit of conviction. So you see all of the roles of the Holy Spirit. Witness and conviction, teacher, truth. All of those are feminine roles. Purposes of, if I could say this in the natural, of women. That's an amazing role. And when you go back to this understanding of weaker vessel, you realize a woman is perfectly crafted, pulled out of man with only feminine DNA. The Holy Spirit is feminine, so she is highly sensitive to the Holy Spirit, much more than a man. Is that a lesser thing? No, it's, it means that she was created to be dependent on God, dependent, and really, and subsequently dependent on her husband. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. I hope, I hope this is making sense. Now, to clarify, because those of you who want to jump to uh, Josh, turn your Bible to Romans chapter 8. He uses the phrase, heirs together, heirs together. Just so you don't think that somehow lesser... Somehow this puts a woman in an underneath position instead of a side-by-side -side position. He uses the phrase heirs together. Read verses uh, 15 to 17, Romans chapter 8. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also, that we may also be glorified together. You see this joint heirs thing? He's talking, of course, to the children of God. He's not talking about gender here, and it's really no different. It's really no different than um, when we saw... Uh, in Song of Solomon, where Solomon called his wife his sister, right? Because he realizes that we're, we're children under the same God, and therefore we're, he, his wife is both his wife and his, and his sister. Kind of uh, your wife is a joint heir. She's an Thank equal you. heir to, to the grace of God, to the throne, to the inheritance, right? Okay, now we're going to swing towards the end. Almost done. We're going to land this very soon. Uh, it talks about all this happening... Uh, so your prayers are not hindered. It's very clear uh, in uh, 1 Peter 3, 7 that if you don't dwell with your wife in all understanding, your prayers will be hindered. 
Uh, Cyrus, if you would turn your Bible to Mark 11, uh, verse 22 to 24. We're just going to spend a few minutes talking about the different things that can hinder God hearing your prayers. You should write these down. Okay? We just already saw a marriage crisis. Men not treating their wives the right way. Prayer is hindered. In James 4, 2 to 3, it says, asking amiss, or selfish motives. You lust and do not have. You murder and covenant and cannot obtain. You fight more, yet you do not have because you do not ask. And when you do ask, you do not receive because you ask amiss. So you could spend it on yourself. Number, number two, what hinders your prayers? Asking with the wrong motives. Right. Reading. Asking, uh, what's number three? Cyrus, verses 22 to 24. Mark chapter 11. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God, for assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things that he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you will receive them, and you will have them. Yeah, number three, asking without doubting. Faith to believe. It says in James, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives liberally without reproach, and it will be given. But let him ask in faith without doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, tossed by the wind. For let no man suppose he will receive anything from the Lord if he's double-minded. Wow. And unstable in all his ways. That's ask without doubting. Number four. Mark 11. Oh, Cyrus, you might as well continue. You're in, you're in Mark. Continue uh, 25 and 26. And you can turn your Bible to Psalm 66. And whenever you stand praying... If you have anything against anyone, forgive him. That your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Don't ask for anything from God if you have unforgiveness in your heart. What's another blockage? Unrepentant hearts. Psalm 66, 16 to 20. Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will tell what he has done for my soul. I cried to him with my mouth, on, and high praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would have listened. But truly God has, has listened. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, because he has not rejected my prayer or removed his steadfast love from me. Did you see that? If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Isaiah wrote, but your iniquities have separated you from God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear you. Isaiah 59, 2. God hides his face if you want to live in your iniquity. John 9, 31. Now we know God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God does hear him. Yeah, God doesn't hear you if you are bearing iniquity, if you're insisting on sinning. And believe it or not, our last verse of the day will land in 1 John. Why don't you read 1 John, way in the back of the Bible. 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. So what have we seen so far when it comes to your prayer? Well, we, we launched into this in this little simple phrase in this seventh verse in 1 Peter 3 where he says, you, you don't dwell with your wife with understanding and treat her like the weaker vessel, meaning the more sensitive vessel. Your prayers are ended. We also saw ask with wrong motives, asking and doubting, you know, without faith, unforgiveness, unrepentant hearts, you know, having iniquity. And one last one for today. 1 John 15, 14 to 15. 1 John 15 or 
First John 5, sorry, 14 to 15. There is no First John 15. I, I made that up. Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. You hear that little phrase? Anything we ask according to his will, he hears us. That's 1 John 5, 14 and 15. So before I do a simple one-minute recap or so, let me just remind you next week we'll continue in verse 8. I'm not quite sure how far we're going to get. We might get to the rest of the chapter. That's uh, 8 to 22. And um, again, the title, His Eyes Are on the Righteous. What we saw here today is first and foremost how important it is that wives submit and number two, how important it is that husbands understand how to dwell with their wives and all the attributes of what a wife should be and how powerful that is as a tool in the, um, the human family as a reflection of the divine family. Uh, the biggest takeaway, I think, today is that the, the, the Holy Spirit is the feminine side of the Trinity uh, and a wife is the Holy Spirit side of the marriage. Okay, so everybody, we'll see you next week at the same time. Many blessings.